This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, good afternoon and welcome to our 11th weekly webinar. My name is Marty Curtis and on behalf of all the advisors at Provisions Wealth Planners, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. This will be our last weekly webinar as our nation is deep into the reopening of our economy and assuming all goes well and we don't experience a major resurgence in the number of COVID cases and our markets don't suffer another uh, disruption, we'll be shifting the webinar frequency to quarterly. As in recent weeks, we have our guests who will speak about 20 to 25 minutes and present current thoughts on the market conditions and the economy and what investors might expect in the near term as well as long term expectations. We sent our guests um, some of your questions for the week and they'll be addressed during the prepared remarks. We'll also follow up by a Q&A session um, so that if I have a couple questions that came in after uh, I've submitted those, make sure that those are touched on. And then we'll also open it up for any questions from the audience at that point. So today I'm pleased to introduce Andrew, excuse me, Andrew Updike. He is a CFA and economist with First Trust. Andrew is an economist and a member of the First Trust economics team that Bloomberg has ranked as one of the top forecasters of the U.S. economy over the past several years. At First Trust, Andrew is responsible for analyzing economic indicators, writing economic commentaries, and producing articles on the First Trust economics blog. Out of a panel of over 100 econ economists, investment strategists, and housing market analysts, the First Trust Economics team was awarded the, quote, Crystal Ball Award by Zillow in partnership with Pulsonomics in 2012, 2013, 14, and most recently in 2015 for accurate home price predictions. Cogent's 2017 survey of advisors ranked First Trust thought leadership material as number one for most read and most shared by advisors with colleagues and clients. Andrew received an MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management and a BA in Business and Economics from Hope College. As mentioned, Andrew holds a chartered financial analyst designation, is a member of the CFA Institute and the CFA Society of Chicago. So having said that, Andrew, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Marty, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on here with you today. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. I, I, I got those questions, some of those that were sent in, um, and, and I'm going to look to address those here, but I think there were some great questions. What I, what I want to do is I, I want to first start and, and talk about what we've seen so far. There's, there's been the movement with the virus, uh, and then there's been movement with the economy, and, and here we stand now two, kind of three months into this. We've been seeing the impacts. We've been living this day to day. Um, and, and we've seen progress, but the data that we get that's telling us on the impacts that the virus and, and the shutdowns had on the economy, they come out with a lag. So, so we get data on things like uh, store sales, things like employment, things like the growth rate of the economy with a delay. So, so this month, in the month of May, we started to get some data on what happened uh, in, in the month of April. Now, let me see if I can, I'm just going to hide this guy so I can write on this. Oh. Sorry, one second. My computer has given me a issue for a moment. Sorry, is it is it blinking for you, Marty? I don't know if it's my, maybe it's back now. Okay, I'm going to try doing it like this. All right. Um, so, so the, uh, employment data that we got, it's showing the impact in the month of April. And in the month of April, we lost 20.5 million jobs in, in a single month. Now, if we, if we put that into perspective, if we think about, you know, where have we seen other downturns in history? When have we seen other impacts in history? Uh, Back in 2008, 2009, as we were going through the financial crisis, which I think we all remember, it was a, a, a deeper downturn. It was a painful period for a lot of people. But over the span of 2008, 2009, into the beginning of 2010, that recession saw us lose 
million jobs. Now, in the month of April, we lost 20.5 million. It means that in a single month, we lost more than twice as many jobs as we did during the entire financial crisis. This was a, a deep downturn, and we see this as we look out the doors. We see this as we walk around our downtowns, as we think about how we've had changes in how we operate. But, you know, with that slowdown on the jobs front, with the, the, the losses that we've seen on the jobs, we've seen with it a slowdown in the economy. If we take a look at, at the first quarter of this year, now through January and February of this year, the economy was growing at around a 3.1% annualized rate. Now that 3.1% rate, if, if we compare that to history, if we had, had, had kept up that pace of growth, uh, throughout the year, that would have been the best year for growth going back to 2005, before the last downturn. But we saw the slowdown. We saw it start to accelerate. We started to see the shelter in place. That, that activity contracted during the month of March, and it, it brought first quarter growth, January, February, March combined. That slowdown in March was enough to move us from a positive 3% pace to a negative 4.8% pace. And the data, the outlook for the second quarter, particularly the month, uh, two months that are behind us, but April in particular, was the worst month for the economy since the Great Depression. And that, that shutdown, the businesses that are closed, not because they had a bad business model, not because they had bad products or bad services, these, these businesses that have put their, uh, had to send their employees home or let them go, not because they were bad workers, but because this was a medically, uh, it was a medical necessity, it was, it was a health and safety shutdown, it's had a dramatic impact on the economy. Now, what you can, I think, see in this chart is that if we go and we look back in time and we see the only other period that we have where we've even hit double digits is back here in 1958. Now, if we've got any history majors on here, what happened back in 1958? Well, this was the Asian flu. And the Asian flu back in 1958, it killed 116,000 Americans. It killed over a million people internationally. Now, our population has roughly doubled. That's the equivalent of, of, of losing about 230,000 people today. But what's notable about that downturn back in, in the late 1950s is that we saw a severe contraction from the virus, and coming out of it, we saw strong growth. And I think that this time around, that, well, once again, we've seen a a sharp decline in economic activity. It's not going to be as prolonged or as drawn out as some of the recessions that we've seen in the past. In fact, I think the growth, that return to growth is going to happen. We're entering into it in these next few weeks as we get into the month of June. Now, it's impacted different people, different companies, different groups in different ways. When we started to see this downturn, it became clear relatively early on that the impact on companies varied by their size. Companies that were larger, that had uh, better access to capital, better access to the debt markets, the equity markets, had better relationships with banks. The larger companies with healthier balance sheets were in a better position to weather this storm. In fact, coming into this environment, there had been a lot of focus over recent years that uh, the, the corporate debt was at all-time record highs. That's this orange line here. But it should be noted that corporate assets were also at all-time record highs, and they had been growing faster than the debt, and a, and a lot of this was cash. The companies that came in with, with higher cash, lower debt, were in a better position just as they were in periods like the recessions in the early 80s, the late 80s, uh, the dot-com bubble, 9-11, 08-09, to ride this storm and ultimately grow as they emerged. 
Now, the groups that we're going to have more trouble, more difficulty, were the small and the medium-sized companies that have less of that access to capital. So we brought about the PPP. This was the program that the government rolled out. It was meant to, to provide financial assistance. Some are calling it a compensation package for these businesses that were shut down really through no decision of their own. It was, it was an attempt to help them get from point A to shut down to point B, the reopening where they could return and grow under their own power. Now, the demand for cash was enormous. That initial package, $349 billion, was snapped up pretty quickly. The money ran out while there were still companies waiting in line. Companies were still putting together their applications. So Congress went back. They, they, they agreed on another package. It brought another roughly $300 billion. And all of this, again, was meant to help these companies uh, stay afloat, stay solvent during this period of time where they were uh, seeing significantly reduced traffic, in some cases, 80 to 90% declines. Now, that tool, one portion of the PPP, it, it was set up uh, with, with a restriction that 75% of the money received from the PPP, this payment protection program, was targeted towards going towards your employees. So you keep the employees on the books, you continue to pay them, uh, you, you keep them employed, hired, so they, they don't go on to unemployment benefits. If you use the money to pay for those employees to keep them employed, you use a portion of that for your rent, you use it for utilities, then at the end of the day, your PPP loan is forgiven. You don't have to pay it back. Now, for the employees that, that didn't qualify or didn't uh, remain employed due to this, we saw an increase in unemployment benefits. It, we were paying out more for longer to a larger group of people. Again, these were both measures, the PPP and the unemployment changes, were meant to help get us from point A to shut down to point B when these groups could get back on their feet, growing under their own power. They were, from the beginning, meant to be a bit like a tourniquet, to blunt the damage, to slow the bleeding, but it wasn't going to be the cure. It wasn't going to fix the issue, and, and the Federal Reserve and Congress don't have enough money to put us back into growth mode through fiscal stimulus alone. So it was, it was meant to kind of bridge this gap. Now, as all of that was going on, the medical community wasn't sitting still. Back when this started to arise here in the United States in early March, we had run less than 1,000 tests nationally. And we were working to ramp up because what we had seen from China, in particular what we had seen from places like South Korea and from Germany, were that identification in the early phases, being able to figure out who has the disease and, and then to contain those individuals was key. Now, we were slow to get it off and, and kind of raid right around here in the middle of March, the president holds a press conference in Washington and, and standing over his shoulders are the leaders of some publicly traded companies. And they come out and say, we are going to put our power behind this as well. We're putting our resources, our supply chains, our logistics, our facilities, employees. We are going to work to aid this effort. And you see this acceleration in the pace of testing. We went from less than 1,000 tests at the beginning of March to 1 million tests completed by the end of that month. And as you can see in April, it continued to accelerate. We went from around 34,000 tests a month back in March to 174,000 tests uh, a day in April. We finished the month with 6.25 million tests. So we added around 5 million tests in the month of April. Well, now here we are in May. As you can see, this continues to ramp up. And through yesterday, which is the latest data we have, we had run 14.9 million tests. And we were on track over these remaining four days to put us at around 16 and a quarter million tests by the end of the month. So we added 5 million tests in April. We're on track to add 10 million tests in May. 
and, and I think critically important is what's happening here. This orange line, which is the percent of tests that are coming back positive. When, when we were early on and we were limited in the number of tests we had, we limited who we tested to those showing the clearest signs, those, those most likely to have the virus. Now, the goal is to expand to the point where we can test more broadly. We know that those in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, without pre-existing conditions, they show, they tend to show more minimal symptoms and in some cases they're asymptomatic. We want to be able to test those groups because they may show minimal symptoms, but they can still spread. This positive movement in the direction of these tests is incredibly important. And at the same time, we've had progress from groups like Oxford University. Now, if we go back and we think about uh, the conversations in February and into March, as all of this was starting up and as the shelter in place, which was happening kind of right in this time frame, the conversations back then said we could have a, a, a vaccine maybe by mid to late 2021. We might be looking at 2022. As we got in towards the end of March, as the, as the lockdowns started and they spread across the country, they said, well, we might not be open until August, September, October. I, I, if you remember the fear in the markets, the medical model suggesting that we might see 2.2 million deaths in the United States. The, the markets started to move lower before any of this started to happen. They started to move lower in February. And as the progress started is when the markets started to see the turn. It was March 23rd. Because they knew the data was going to be bad. We knew we were going to see the impact. But the question was, how quickly can we move on and can we return to growth from this? And this progress that we've seen here, the progress that we've seen from Oxford, it's not going to be 2021 or 2022. Oxford University is in stage three testing right now. And they believe they're on track to have their uh, vaccine available in September of this year, the U United Kingdom government is targeting having 30 million doses in September. And then at Oxford University, they signed a deal with AstraZeneca, a drug producer. They're targeting 100 million doses by the end of the year. Right after they announced this, Pfizer, another producer, came out and said, well, we're also entering into advanced testing. We think we're going to have that in uh, uh, emergency use in the fall, most likely October, so a little bit behind. But we're also planning to be in mass production at the end of this year. Then the next day comes Gilead talking about their treatment, remdesivir, and the results that it's having. Then we're getting data on Moderna. We're having information coming out from Merck. It's, it's incredible the progress that we're making. And, and it's, it's difficult to do when you're in a situation like we as a nation were in back here where you're, you've got a group around a table trying to, to lead the charge, make the decisions from Washington. When you have a group of really smart people, no matter how smart they are, there's only so much that they can do. But when we opened it up and, and, and the private sector, entrepreneurs, innovators came in, we had hundreds, if not thousands of failures in terms of trying to design a vaccine, trying to come up with ways to identify and to contain. But from those thousands of failures, we had some victories. And you only need a few of those victories coming from all those trials to see the progress start to add up. And we're living in a, a period of time where data travels so quickly. It travels in real time and that progress being made here in, in France, in Germany, in Italy, Australia, Japan, as one place makes progress, the others see that and follow suit. And, and we continue to see this progress and it's brought us to here. Where again, two, three months ago, the thought that we would have the bulk of the country at least partially reopened in May, back in March when the markets were, were at their lows, this was unthinkable. And now here we sit with just a handful of states, and even they are, are planning to reopen sooner. Now, some of these, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, they're opening up in stages. 
But the more we know about the disease, the more progress we make, the better we understand it and we know more, we understand more every single day. It's allowed us to start this process. Now we're watching the data. We're watching it from Texas. We're watching it from Florida. We're watching it from Georgia. We're watching the places that opened up early to see, do we see spikes in cases? Do we see signs that this reopening is, is causing more issues? But nationally, the numbers continue to move lower. We, we, we need to do it safely, but from an economic standpoint, we needed this reopening. This was the cure that the PPP, the unemployment, was trying to protect to get to. And it's happening sooner than people thought. And as, as the data kept pointing that this reopening date could potentially move sooner and that, that, that uh, things would start to turn, that we would see the vaccines, that we would see the treatment earlier than expected, the market started to move with it. So now as we look to check the pace, we try to check and see, you know, how is this opening process moving along? Well, we're seeing it in, in the real-time high-frequency data, the stuff that doesn't report with a one-month, two-month lag. This is stuff that's telling us what just happened this week. We have the TSA data showing what happened over recent weeks. We still have a long way to go, but people are getting back on planes. People are getting back on the roads. There's rail car traffic that's picking up. People are getting back to movies. Jobless claims are moving in a positive direction. There's a ways to go. We're still a ways below where we were six months ago, a year ago, but we're in the progress phase. Whereas a month ago, two months ago, the data was looking more dire with each passing week. Now the data's turned the corner and the green shoots of growth are there. Now, I, I don't think that this growth is going to be uh, it's spread evenly across states or even across industries. States that took longer to open up, we saw here in Illinois, we saw people vote with their feet. As, as the, the shutdown extended and we knew, we know here in, the, in, in Illinois, our finances as a state are terrible. And, and all the efforts, all the shutdowns, the impact it's having on government revenues is, is going to ultimately need to get paid for down the road. That's going to be a consideration. But as other places started to open up, and they were doing so safely, but they were getting back to business, we saw businesses start to move. So, so some states will be a little slower. Some will be a little faster. One thing I, I think from an industry or a sector standpoint, one thing we've seen historically is that the 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 sectors at the center of a downturn get a lot of focus as we emerge. So going back to 0809, that was the banking sector, right? They were the key focus on what happened. We were undercapitalized. Consumers were overlevered. And if you look at the data on where the banks stood back then, and then look at where they are now, this happened for a reason. The Federal Reserve, who oversees the banking system, they implemented stress tests, simulations of situations worse than 0809 that the banks needed to be able to stand up against on an ongoing basis. They needed the balance sheet strength to survive those simulations to continue doing the types of things they want to do as publicly traded companies. So they reduced their loans to deposits. They got extra equity. They took on the, this tier one capital ratio. This is their ultra safe assets that they hold against their risky lending. They saw a significant improvement. Now, this time around, I think we're going to see something similar. But, but uh, last time, it was the areas, it was the, the sector that people were blaming, saying they were the ones that were kind of at the center of the reason we were declining. This time around, it's the groups that are, are on the cures side. The healthcare community, the spending we're already seeing on biotechnology, on, on the treatments, on preparing creating reserve stockpiles so that the next time we see some type of virus, we're better positioned for it. At the same time, as we've moved from the outside indoors and indoors online, whether that's through these meetings or whether it's through how we're working, it's created a demand and need for spending on the telecommunications infrastructure. To, to create, it's created a need to spend on cybersecurity, on, on the cloud so people can work remotely. 
It's created opportunities. Those sectors, from an economic standpoint, are likely to return to growth faster, to see their employees return faster. Some, it will take a little longer. Energy's had its own dynamics. The financial industry has its own questions and uncertainties. Now those uncertainties, they create opportunity. Some of those are longer term opportunities, longer term considerations, but, but the news, this news that shows us that we're, we're, we, we turn that corner. And from an economic standpoint, I think we turn the corner. It's even out in May, we're gonna return to growth in June. And similar to what we saw in 58, that downturn, the, the significant downturn we're seeing in the second quarter, I think we're gonna see a significant upturn in Q3. We're gonna continue to grow in Q4 and into 2021. And I think it's, it's going to take us until about the end of 2021 to get back to where we were when all of this started, but we're on that road now. So from a financial perspective, we're looking at where do we want to be? How do we want to position? How do we want to think about this environment as we enter into the recovery phase? Now, the last thing I want to say, and then I, I want to jump into questions, is I think it's incredibly important to remember that uh, you don't invest in GDP. You don't invest in the economy. The companies that I, I see across the street from me in downtown Wheaton, the small and medium-sized businesses, they would love to be publicly traded companies. There are, are tens, hundreds of thousands of companies that would love to grow to that point, to have the, the potential, the leadership teams, the opportunity, the products, that creates that demand to be a publicly traded company. You don't get there by accident. And those, those market-based companies, they tend to be the faster growing side of the economy. And they tend to have a broader diversification across the country, which is important when this happens. My local hardware store, right over in here, they're gonna have an issue. They're having an issue right now because the, the sales, if they don't have it right here, it's not somewhere else. But if you're a publicly traded national company, well, you have exposure in Texas and Florida and Georgia and Colorado. So as they've reopened, they've gotten back to growth faster. And when we came inside and went online, if I can't go to my hardware store, but I still need to replace a light bulb, I still need to replace a toilet, I still need to do work around my house. And with people sitting at home, they're spending money on that work they're, they're going to what is available. And those groups, if you think about the stores that have been able to stay open or think about where the shopping activity has taken place, if it's moved online, it's gone to those who have the supply chains, the websites, the ability to access during these times. And they tend to be the large companies, the publicly traded companies. That's why I think we've seen a return faster. The markets moved lower, quicker, than the economic data, I think they move faster coming out of it. Historically, they've often moved uh, about three months ahead of when the economic recovery begins. That's not to say we won't retest any lows. I don't think we will because what we saw back in March was those worst case scenarios being priced into the markets. But there's, there's still uncertainty ahead. But I, I think the market, the market has started that path forward. It's forward looking, it sees the growth, it sees the opportunity that lies ahead of us. And it can continue to grow as the economy heals. I think the market's gonna continue to grow and I think it'll grow faster than the economy as a whole. Why don't I stop there and let's take some time to go through questions. Okay, thanks Andrew. You know what, that was, um, that's enlightening and, and it's, I appreciate a positive tone. <laughs> You know, as we were going through this in in March and, and April, it was it wasn't as positive. And to see you know the numbers actually stacking up and saying, you know what, this is this is not as bad as what we originally um, were fearing. That's yeah. that's really awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Um, so having said that, what's your biggest fear right now as the market seems to be coming out of this? The the biggest fear right now. Is, is that that question of do we see another resurgence? Do we see a second wave? And, and I don't know. I, I think it's really hard to tell. We do have countries that are ahead of us. 
we have countries that are further along in the process, places like China, South Korea, Japan, um, and, and, and so we're watching their data as well to see whether or not they're seeing pickups. And there are some pickups in very small pockets, but nothing to the magnitude uh, of, of you know, growing and being a, a larger outbreak than what we initially saw. And, and as I look at this chart, this testing chart, again, as we continue to progress, as we enter in the summer and, and humidity, the heat should be factors on our side in terms of, of uh, preventing a further spread of the virus. It, the, the virus, it doesn't live as long. It, it doesn't survive as well in those climates. The question is, are we going to see something as we move, let's say, back towards the winter? But this, the medical community is not going to be stopping. And so as I look out and I think about the months, the weeks ahead, this continued work, this continued process means that if we start to see a pickup here or anywhere else in the world, we're going to be in a better position than, than we were when this started initially. We, we know more every single day. We never start a day further back in the learning curve than, than we were the day before. Every single day is progress to step forward in terms of how does it spread? Where has it spread? How many people had it that we didn't even know about? We're, we're learning that information each day and, and we're getting closer to both a vaccine and a treatment. Uh, but but it is, it's, it's gonna remain something the markets are thinking about. It's going to remain something that, that states, nations are thinking about, because if we see that resurgence and we need to go back into a lockdown, it's going to have an impact both on the GDP growth for the, the remainder of the year and I think on the market outlook. I think the likelihood is low that we see a significant second outbreak, um, but, but the uncertainty that exists with that is my biggest fear on what could cause a downturn in the markets. Okay. So when we looked at the map of the states that have, you know, they've already reopening, now we've got Michigan that's reopening soon. So yep. we've got Illinois and, you know, New Jersey, Delaware, um, D.C. that have not. Yes. So what, I mean, we, I, I can appreciate it if you're a local hardware store, right? That's not good news for you. Um, right. So how, I mean, it's almost a, a game of catch up at this point for those businesses in those states, isn't it? It is. And really it is. And, and we've seen, in particular with Illinois, we've seen outflows of people moving from Illinois to places like Texas down to places like Florida. Um, that's one of the things, California, if you remember a few weeks ago, right, California was not open. And, and, and remember, California originally said that they weren't planning to be open until August and September. And that was the early stages of this. They, you know, that's, that's when they thought they could start doing partial reopenings. And then they started to get pressure. Elon Musk comes out and says, listen, if, if, if I can't operate, if we are willing to take the precautions, if we're willing to do the safe steps needed to, to protect our workers and you're still saying, I, I can't do it, well, I'm going to move. I'm going to move to Arizona or I'm going to move to Texas. And, and when the businesses started to push and said, look, our, our, our other companies in places like Arizona, Texas, Florida, Georgia, uh, as they reopen and they're doing it safely and they're getting back to business, we in these states that are not allowed to operate, we're falling behind. And, and the politicians know those are voters, those are funders in, in the future. And so these states that said they were going to wait longer have said, you know what, okay, we're going we're gonna to figure out how we can do this in pieces. So it, it does mean that some of these places are going to be a little bit further behind. It's going to impact state and local revenues. California has the advantage that a lot of their activity takes place online. They, they are a leader on the tech side and tech can be done remotely. You can do that from home. It's not like Michigan where you shut down the, the auto factories and all yeah. of a sudden all of these workers can't work because you can't do that remotely. I think the states are going to feel this for the months and years ahead. They'll feel it in their finances. They'll, they'll, they'll feel it uh, because companies are going to look at this and say, if we have another virus outbreak at some point in the future, three years, five years, 10 years from now, how did you as a state react? Because if we're going to be committing to your state, to building factories, work in your environments, we need to know how do you respond when, when crisis hits? 
And so they're going to take that into consideration, the impact it would have on their ability to do business into the future. It makes other states a more attractive place to set up shop over the long term. So, yeah, I think I think we're going to see this. I think we're going to see the impacts of this. It's, it's going to last for a little while afterwards. That certainly isn't what Illinois needs, is it? <laughs> no, no, certainly not. OK, OK. So what? What sectors do you think are the most compelling in the near future? In so in the near future, um, th there were some opportunities I think that were created in the healthcare, that were created in in infotech, the tech side of things, and communication services. Those were the ones that, that there was a clear identification of that demand that we needed investment, and that activity has already started. The investment has already started. You see some of those companies when you look at the hiring data, uh, when you look at their sales data. They've survived better. Now, some of that, you know, people started to see that. They, they, they identified and we started to see those movements happening over the last month, month and a half. There's questions on the short term and the long term. And the mm -hmm. short term, that identification and the movement into those has taken some of that, that future growth. If you were to invest now, the opportunity now versus two weeks ago, four weeks ago, it's, it's diminished a little bit. There's still, I think, a lot of opportunities. But one thing I would say is we think about these opportunities. As, as people read and they see things like, you know, the, the airlines that got beat down or, or the cruise ships that get beat down or energy going into negative territory and say, hey, is this an opportunity? You know, should I jump on it? I would say anybody who's on the call who's thinking about that, the first thing you should do is have the conversation with your financial advisor. There's reasons that you plan over time. Because nobody, if you go back seven months ago and said, hey, are we going to see a recession in 2020? And this is, let's say, October, November of last year. I don't think anybody would have said, yeah, we're having it because of a global pandemic. There's unpredictable things that happen. You can plan and prepare and you can, you can make kind of uh, alterations for the things that are predictable. But you have a plan in place because ultimately over time, these unpredictabilities mean you're better rewarded for time in the market than timing the market. And, and so have that conversation with your advisor because they understand, you know, what are your needs short term and long term? And as you have conversations on your risk tolerances, what makes sense for some people might not make sense for others. And that's where, from my standpoint, where, where I work, I get to look at the markets and I get to look from a, a, a high level fundamentals, you know, valuation versus price. Across sectors, across uh, asset classes, we get to do this evaluation, but, but there is no singular right answer that, that applies to every single person. And, and so we stand here as a resource to talk with Marty and the team, Eric, Chris, Scott, Sue, Bart. We, we get to talk as they say, okay, I have this individual client with this specific need because each and every one of you has unique needs. We get to have that conversation on what could be those poss those those opportunities short term and long term, and I think that's. But I, I think that that conversation that you all have that that's an ongoing conversation, and the preparations you make for good times and bad is is such a critical thing over time, because the unpredictability. Will we see volatility later in the year? We could. Will there be unexpected events? Yeah, there almost always are unexpected events. And so you, you, you make these allocations, you think about your, your investments, you think about what, you, what you're aiming for long term, and then you trust the process when things get crazy, when it seems really hard to stick to your guns, and you say, I, I want to I dump out of all this stuff, I want to move. That's why I, I really appreciate Marty and the team over there for what they do. Uh, you know what, Andrew, thank you. We... Um... <clears throat> We have those conversations all day long, and I've been I've been caught, you know, they think they have me in a pickle saying, well, you just told this person that they should be all in the market, whatever the case may be. And you're yeah. telling me, no, and I'm saying, no, different scenario, different. We're trying to do two different things. And yeah. it really starts with, you know, the yellow pad of paper, and let's just talk about goals and objectives and, and the whole planning. Um, process that we go through with clients so I appreciate yeah. those comments it, it that really is that's where that's where it all starts and stops I mean that's that's it um, yeah absolutely so thank you for that um what what positive effects 
you think that we will um, see kind of longer term. One one person put in, you know, the reindustrialization, re <laughs> say that four times quickly, um, yeah. of America. Um, yeah. yeah and, and I would say we started to see that even before this picked up. Because of, of the, the, you know, if this was six months ago, our conversation, we would have been talking about what was going on with the U.S.-China trade dispute. That was the dominant piece of the conversation last year. That was what at the end of 2018, you remember the market declines at the end of 2018, it was concerns over, are we going to see a recession from this U.S.-China trade dispute? Well, then last year, we grow above 2% real growth. We did see some slowdown in investment. But what was taking place throughout 2019? is that companies started to shift supply chains. They started to move them out of China to places like uh, South Korea and Taiwan on the tech side. They started moving them to places like uh, Mexico, Canada, Japan, the, the groups that we made new trade agreements with last year. We started doing more trade with our European partners, and we started to bring some of that, that business back home. Um, and, and so, you know, we're going to continue to see that taking place. I think pharmaceutical, the healthcare industry has been clearly identified throughout this. And I think we're going to see some incentives put into place to bring that back to the United States or to bring it towards partners that we have more reliability with the supply chains and, and less concerns over things like um, uh, intellectual property theft. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we're continuing to move in that direction. And I think one of the things, you know, when, when everyone is nervous, Around the world, when everyone is scared, where do they shift to? Well, they, they shift towards the United States. And if you look at what's happened, when, when people have moved out of emerging markets, they've even moved out of Europe, everybody wants, they trust the United States to pay their bills. And, and we can continue to pay our bills. We've been running up the debt, but it, it remains at manageable levels. And it's, it's reaffirmed, I think, the U.S. position as that, the, the, the kind of major driver. The, it's, it's reinforced the position of the U.S. dollar. And, I, you know, we can get political. There's all sorts of political stuff that gets brought out. And this is an election year, so don't expect it to stop soon. People are going to point to that and they're going to question the U.S. response. And we can go through the data all day long on the U.S. response with testing, U.S. How, the, the results that we've seen here. But I think as we look forward, we've made some changes. We've made some adaptations as a nation and internationally um, that I think are going to be positives for growth. The improvements in our supply chains, the improvements in how we operate and, and preparations for that stage that we've been moving towards of that movement online. Brick and mortar, those stores have been kind of on the decline for a while now. And this situation where people say, okay, I need an online presence. I need an ability to interact with my customers to, to be able to serve them even when the doors are shut. It's kind of incredible. If you think 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, if we had this type of shutdown, we had the pandemic, think about how much worse this would be. We couldn't do this same level of working remotely. We couldn't access our, our machines from our offices. And we couldn't do these WebEx meetings. We couldn't, you know, buy, we couldn't continue to buy our goods and our services online. We've already emerged. We've grown so much technologically, process-wise, the innovations, the entrepreneurship has, has brought us to a point that dampened the impact of what happened. And I think we're continuing in that direction. Um, so I, I, think, I think there's pauses. We learn from every experience. We as a country, as, as a nation, as a, a globe, internationally, we grow from every, every experience that we have. And I think there's, there's some learning that may hinder growth in the future if we learn that our response anytime that there's fear is to do this type of shutdown. But I, I, I have some, some faith and some belief that we're going to learn from some of the mistakes we made on the shutdown side and that it's, it's going to put us in a better position as we continue to grow moving forward. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. So, um, <clears throat> we're closing in on 45 minutes. So I've got one last mm -hmm. question I'm going to pose to you. Um, and this is an election year. Um, yeah. so what, what do you think that does in addition to everything else going on? Yeah, it certainly made that picture a little more interesting. Um, it's shifted some of the dynamics it, going into this. 
if we looked at some of the polls and we looked at, in particular, if we were looking at the end of last year with the economic growth we'd had, where the markets were at, unemployment was at three and a half percent, the lowest level since the late 1960s. The, the odds were in, in Trump's favor for re-election. As things started to deteriorate, there's been questions. If you look at the betting markets or the odds markets, it shifted a bit towards Biden. And, and we're going to see shifts either way. And, and really, the reaction, the growth coming out of this, where people are at, and, and as they look at their situation five months from now, preparing for the election, um, it's, it's going to have an impact. What happens between now and then? And I wish I could say exactly what that's going to look like, but I don't know. But here's one thing I, I would say that I think is important to remember. Well, the spotlight's going to be on the presidential election. It's going to be center ring, the theatrics, the, the media coverage will focus on that. Continue to watch what happens with the House and the Senate, right? The House right now is held by the Democrats. The Senate is held by the Republicans. And right now, the most likely scenario is that that stays as it is, that that it remains a split between the House and the Senate, between the parties. And if that if that occurs and they remain split, then regardless of who the president is at the beginning of next year being sworn into office, uh, it's going to dampen their ability to make drastic changes. So let's say Biden comes through and Biden wins and, and wants to put in place some changes. Well, he's going to have a difficult time getting that through a, a Republican Senate. Likewise, if Trump gets reelected, he's going to have some difficulty pushing legislation through a Democratic House. The checks and balances that prevent wide swings, and it's one of the key reasons the U.S. is so um, well positioned internationally. Well, well, we have some cantankerous stuff coming out of Washington. The checks and balances do what they're supposed to do. So I would focus on that, and I would also remember that that. You know, the chance for a wide swing in policy, if we look back to 0809, we had Obama coming into office and the Democrats had the presidency, the House and the Senate. And, and if you look at what they did from a policy standpoint, entering into that role when there was a recession, they didn't change tax rates. They extended the Bush era tax cuts. Because when you're in a recession, when you're growing out of a painful period, you, you, you're not going to see a big ramp up in corporate tax rates and, and in individual tax rates because the focus is going to be on the recovery. Could it have impacts two years, three years from now? It could. At that point, we're also going to be talking midterm elections and what could happen with the House and the Senate. So I'm not expecting drastic changes in policy. If you, if you had to, you know, if I had to make a bet right now and say, who do I think is going to be in office at, at next year? I, I think that, that, Trump is has got a slight edge in getting reelected. I'm I'm a little bit uh, against kind of the the national vote because well 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 Biden's been winning in some of the national odds. Trump's been strengthening in some of the key battleground states. So there's there's a lot to see between now and then. There's a lot that's still going to be decided, but keep that eye, keep the ear on what's happening on the the House and Senate side and remember the the role they play in preventing wide changes in policy. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are we're running uh, to the tail end of what I I s promised you that we would take of your time today. So, <clears throat> Andrew, thank you so much for for your thoughts, for your wisdom, your expertise, uh, the whole thing. It was just it was really great, and I, I really do appreciate it. And also thank everybody on the call. Um, as we wind down our weekly webinars, um, <clears throat> we'll be watching for things if, if, if need be. If, if we have interest, we certainly will go back to a more frequent basis. Um, but as of at this point, um, we're going to be shifting to more of a quarterly. Um, in order to get in sync kind of with the quarters, the next scheduled um, webinar will be Wednesday. July 29th, again at three o'clock, um, and look for your email notifications and, and other <clears throat> social media outlets to uh, get the information to you. Um, so until then, please reach out to your advisor if you have any questions or comments. Um, thank you again for all the support and confidence that you place in your advisors at Provisions Wealth Planners, and we'll talk to you soon.
Stay well, everyone. Goodbye.